Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. We're tonight, we're gonna look at one of my favorite things, zombies, and specifically a zombie outbreak. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. Tonight we're joined by our two zombie experts, Stacy Thibodeau and Jeff Lukens. Stacy holds a Bachelor's of Science in Biology and Chemistry and a Master's degree in Educational Leadership from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. She's been in the science classroom for 21 years and currently teaches at Southside High School in Youngsville, Louisiana, where she teaches robotics, chemistry one and two. She's also taught biomedical science courses in Project Lead the Way program and Chemistry 1 and 2 AP. She uses TI technology to assist her teaching, data collection, and modeling math concepts, linking them to science content. Stacy, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. And Jeff, when he retired from teaching in 2014, had taught high school science for 34 years. He now delivers professional development across North America for the T-Cubed organization as a full-time science instructor. He continues to author activities for all levels of science teachers and learners. Jeff, thanks for joining us tonight. Hey, Mike, thanks, good to be here. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free at any time to send any questions to Jeff or Stacy using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, this session is being recorded and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance as well as a link for the documents at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting communicate from the very top of the WebEx menu and choose audio broadcast. At this point, Stacy is gonna discuss our agenda. So thank you guys all for being here. Um, it's going to be a weird school year, so hopefully we can give you some insight into um, one of Jeff and I's favorite activities um, with zombies. And so we're going to show you how you can use mathematical modeling both with the CX2, Inspire CX2, as well as on the TI-84CE. Awesome, Stacy. Thanks so much. And Jeff, uh, can you talk through some of our expected outcomes tonight? Sure, we're, we're going to, um, a lot of this looks really mathy, the first part, and if you're a math teacher, you're probably all uh, giddy about that, and that's good, because we're gonna do some pretty cool math stuff. We're gonna demonstrate some math modeling using, of all things, uh, zombies. Uh, one of the big things we're going to be doing, and uh, one of the big things I think is uh, critical in a math and science classroom is interpreting data and then making predictions from those data. And so that's uh, gonna be sort of the theme running throughout our time together tonight. Uh, we will take a, uh, a hard look at some anatomy, actually. So some science part, the S in STEM, we're gonna take a look at that by looking at the human brain and some of its structure and functional parts of the brain. And then we will um, address a uh, situation that we, when we wrote the zombie activity, didn't really think would come true, but it actually has been coming true here for the last several months. And we will uh, make parallels between what's been happening in most of the year 2020 with the uh, situation in this zombie activity. Jeff, thanks so much. Let me uh, give you control and feel free to share your screen. All right. Well, thanks, Mike, and everybody welcome, and thank you for being here. I'm going to be uh, kind of the driver of the uh, software tonight, and Stacy is Stacy and I are going to be kind of tag teaming, going back and forth with um, descriptions of what we're going to be taking a look at on both the TI-84 and also the TI-Inspire CX. I wanted, before we started our activities tonight, I wanted to show you, so knowing myself, I would have forgotten to do this, I wanna make sure you know where to locate these activities. All these activities are free on TI's website and there is the web address. And I'm sure if you are a webinar uh, attendee with any regularity, you know that education.ti.com is the magic site where all these activities are housed. 
Uh, this one, the zombie activity, is actually housed in a place where you may not have spent a whole lot of time. So I just wanted to show you that. Uh, on the TI website, if we go to activities, we just hover over, I'm not clicking on anything, all of these things pop up underneath it. And we are going to go to STEM activities. And then under STEM activities, if you scroll down a little bit, we have uh, some of the items that are available to you in the STEM area. And there it is, STEM Behind Hollywood. And uh, we don't really have a lot of time tonight to go over the background and sort of the backstory behind uh, these STEM Behind Hollywood activities, but I, we will make a little bit of mention of that just so you know some context. So if we go to STEM Behind Hollywood, and be in STEM Behind Hollywood, we have several different offerings. And the first one, there it is, there's the zombie activity. So this is actually the one that we are going to uh, be doing tonight, both on the TI-84 and also the TI-Inspire. Uh, so if you go to run, I'm not going to click on that, but run this way means that, that that will take you to the activity so you can load those onto your computer and then use them on your calculators. Okay, so we're going to start, Stacey and I are going to start with the activity as it uh, appears on the TI-84. And uh, for this this part of the show tonight, if you will, I'm using a piece of software called TI Smart View, which is basically a, a calculator emulator that you can put on a computer. And, and uh, I believe it's a free piece of software. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but uh, if not, I'm sure you can get your hands on it somehow. But the TI Smart View technology allows you to display the TI-84 on a Promethean board or a smart board or a whiteboard or even just on a screen and then demonstrate and show the students uh, what it is that, that they should be working on, what it is that you're working on. So here's our introductory page to this activity, the zombie apocalypse part one, which is sort of a teaser because it kind of implies that there's more than one part and there indeed is. And toward the end of our time together tonight, we'll just kind of throw that at you and, and, and let you know that um, there is another follow-up activity to this that you can that you can do on the TI Inspire. So what we have here is a, uh, a guy that is uh, clearly becoming not so well and turning into a zombie. So on the on the TI-84, once you have this on the calculator, and then of course the screen would be up here on the left side of my screen, it would be above the keyboard or keypad. To move from one page to the next, we're just gonna press the right arrow. So it's pretty intuitive. So I'm gonna go ahead and press the right arrow. And in both of the activities, we have what we uh, term as the scenario. So we're setting up the, setting the table for the students to let them know uh, what this zombie outbreak is all about, how this thing is transmitted, this thing meaning the virus, we're gonna call this a zombie virus, how it's transmitted from a sick person or a zombie to a non-sick person. When we get to the Inspire activity, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll play, we'll spend a little bit more time on this scenario because there's a little bit more information on the Inspire document because you can fit a little bit more text on a page. So let's just kind of go through a couple of things here on the 84 first. Um, these pages you'll see are very similar on the 84 and on the on TI Inspire. The font is a little bit different and some things look a little bit different aesthetically, but nevertheless, the information is, is mostly the same on both of these platforms. So here we talk about those parts of the brain. And the parts of the brain we're going to deal with and the parts of the brain we're going to say that this zombie virus impacts are uh, two of them you've probably heard of before, I even if you're not a, a science person, the cerebellum, which is sort of in the back of the brain. We'll take a look at that in a moment. And the frontal lobe is part of the cerebrum, which is the biggest region of the brain. The other two parts are, are uh, a little more obscure, but no less significant, the hypothalamus and the amygdala. And again, we'll, we'll spend a little more time on those in just a few minutes. So here's the diagram of the brain. And in green, you can see that frontal lobe <clears throat> is aptly named. By the way, this person would be facing to the left. So the eyes of this person would be right over here, like eh, probably about where the word hypothalamus is. So here's the front part of the brain, the frontal lobe, cerebrum. Cerebellum is here, and the amygdala and the hypothalamus are kind of buried in the middle of the brain. So we're looking at, 
a section, half of the brain essentially here that's, that is cut right down the middle. So we're looking at, in this case, the right side of this person's brain. So there's a diagram. And then we have some uh, symptoms that a person who would be infected with a zombie virus would be uh, exhibiting. And this is a good time to, to call up uh, a bit of the backstory here. We, when we wrote this activity several years ago, um, we didn't just write it and say, well, people will believe it, it's good enough, it doesn't matter if, it's, uh, if we're honest or not, or if we're accurate. Hardly. That's not what happened at all. We actually had a guy, a gentleman, help us who is a zombie expert. I know that sounds a little bit odd, but he is a zombie expert, um, self-proclaimed and self-trained zombie expert, I might add. And his name is Dr. Steven Schlossman. And Dr. Schlossman, uh, you know, when you hear the phrase zombie expert, you might want to, you know, you might think, well, I should back away slowly from this guy or whatever. But that's not the case at all. He's actually a professor at the Harvard Medical School and uh, is a great guy. And um, I'm from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So he grew up actually right down the road from me in Kansas City, which is, you know, several hours down the road, but nevertheless straight south of me. And now he's at Harvard. And uh, he says this, and then this statement, I, I will never forget when he said this. He said, zombies aren't real, which that part, you know, I, I won't forget that either. Harvard makes him say that when he gives speeches. Zombies aren't real, but the conditions and their characteristics in people are real, just not all at the same time. So all of these uh, conditions here, like a zombies clumsily shuffle forward, the classic zombie look, right? And when if somebody were to describe the behavior of zombies, some of these would definitely come into play and come into their vocabulary when they were describing that. So uh, again, when we get to the Inspire activity, I'll spend a little bit more time how to, uh, about how to use a page like this. I mean, if you're going to use this activity just for the sake of spending a day in class and not having to do a whole lot, then uh, we're not really being thinking teachers. We want to, as teachers, we want to think about how we can make learning the best we can for our students and how we can relate it to real life. And that's the, the point of, of this activity. And by golly, the, the real life scenario that has suddenly shown up in this zombie activity is pretty amazing. So on the next page, you can see here that the directions are, are pretty self-explanatory. We are just going to take a look at a, uh, a guy here who is going to turn into a zombie. And I think what we'll do, well, I'll, I'll just go ahead and play through this just a little bit. We're gonna press the right arrow <clears throat> to play and to end this little animation or this little transformation that's going to happen with this gentleman. So let's go ahead and take a look at what happens to him. So here we are in stage, we call that stage zero. There's stage one, he's starting to look a little rough. He's got an early, and I'm not clicking on anything. This is automatically running through uh, on the TI-84. So there's stage three, he's starting to look a little scary. And then in stage four, he is full-blown uh, zombie infection. And then if you just let this go, it just loops right through all four of these stages of the infection over and over and over. And if we look at the, the guy on the left turning into the zombie, obviously the facial, uh, his facial rep representations or characteristics are changing a lot. And uh, subtly, well, most of the time students aren't looking at the brain, but this time just take a look at the brain and watch what happens as he goes through the different stages. The brain is starting to change. The cerebrum and the cerebellum are starting to shrivel up or shrink up a bit. And the amygdala and the hypothalamus are getting all red and infected. Okay, so there's that guy turning into a zombie. Now, here's the deal. You're, if you're teachers, and most of you probably are, maybe all of you are, you know that if you can get the hook in a student, or a group of students. By that, I mean, if you can get their attention, you can take them about anywhere you wanna go. And having done this activity with literally thousands of students and teachers, I can honestly say that at this point, the hook is buried in that, in that person. And you can pretty much do whatever you want because their level of interest is off the charts. 
So here we have, we're going to just kind of kind of call it on this uh, format with the um, with the TI-84. So maybe I can move ahead here. There we go. So here we have this thing called the background of the crisis. And right now we're going to make the shift over to the TI Inspire because the, the graphics are a little bit better on the Inspire, although you're going to see some very, very uh, similar representations of the zombie virus. And while I'm doing that, Stacy, I haven't really deferred to you yet. Do you want to anything to throw in here? Yeah. So um, if you're new to the software, either the uh, Inspire software that Jeff's showing now or the Smart View. If you notice when Jeff was clicking on the buttons on the uh, emulator part, it turned red. And so that's a great teacher tool, especially if your students are new to learning how to use the technology that the buttons you're pushing um, at the same time the students are able to see it. Um, another thing when Jeff showed you guys on the website where to download the information as far as the files that you're seeing, there are teacher notes, there are student guides. Um, if you wanted to hand out something to your students or post it on your virtual learning platform, whatever. Um, when I first started using TI technology in my classroom, the first thing I did was went to the website and said, what does TI have? And then I made my lesson plans and the teacher notes um, not only provide you with um, the background information to make sure you're um, not only teaching the content, but you have some information of where the activity is going, but then there's the technology notes or the tech tips um, that really help you be kind of the expert, especially when you're doing this. Um, Mike put in the chat a while ago about the free software. If you're in a virtual situation right now or you're some kind of hybrid, this is a, a great way or great tool to use um, that still allows you to have that technology piece, the tried and true activities, the fun stuff, who doesn't love zombies, um, and then get the student's attention, like Jeff was saying, but not necessarily every kid has to have a handheld. Um, is it best if every kid can see it on their handheld? Absolutely, but we're in a different situation this year. Um, so I just wanted to point out those two things that the software emulator that Jeff's walking you through shows the red buttons, um, so that makes it easy for students to follow along if they do have the handheld. And then the second thing was that there are the teacher notes and student notes um, that you could download as well. That's great stuff, Stacey. Thank you for bringing that up. And, and yeah, the, the red button thing is huge for kids. I did see, Stacey, while you were, where you were visiting, and maybe you can address this better than I can because I saw a chat pop up um, and I didn't catch the name, but I think the gist of it was, have, have we ever gotten any kind of pushback or um, comments from parents because some of this activity can look kind of, I, I think I saw the word evil in there, I, maybe creepy, scary, whatever. Um, Stacey, let me let you, let me, let, would you address that? And then I'll, I'll give a couple thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. So I I have pretty much taught every science in the book except for physics um, on the high school campus. And I use this in my anatomy and physiology class um, as the anatomy and physiology lesson of part of discussing the brain. Um, as high school students, they are curious. They're curious about what they see on TV or what they hear. Um, Walking Dead was really big for a long time. It's still, if you're a Walking Dead fan, um, it's still big. And I have never had any um, pushback because it's not so much the notion of what a zombie represents, but the fact that diseases affect our bodies in different ways. And it just so happens that this virus, um, which as Jeff progresses through this activity, affects the brain in real world situations where some viruses affect our brains. Um, and so I, I've never had any pushback. Um, we actually make the brain and we talk about what's happening um, in the brain and when it normally happens. Uh, and so, I, again, I've, I've taught at two schools with zombie activity and I, I haven't had any pushback from parents or administration. Thanks, Stacey, for, for mentioning that. And that's good news. I mean, I can see, uh, again, I didn't catch the entire question, but 
I think I got the gist of it. Uh, I can see, you know, people getting a little bit nervous about that. I mean, I taught biology my whole career, and so some of the things that we talked about and did in biology um, that were not a big issue when I first started teaching ended up being a little bigger issue as I progressed in my career, like dissections and, and blood typing and that type of thing. Um, I will also say this, at least in the Inspire activity, the Inspire activities, when you load them onto your computer, there's a page sorter where you can take a look at all of the pages in the activity. And as a teacher, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing any activity without looking at it first. And so as a teacher, if you look through those pages and you see a page or two and you're like, whoa, this one may not be appropriate, you can just delete them. So the, uh, and here's what it looks like. There's the, the page sorter. So we have all of these pages. If let's say I didn't want that page, let's say I wanted to get rid of it, I could just press delete on my computer and it would get rid of that scenario. So that's, that's another uh, really nice thing as well, where you can just, you can customize these to the particular uh, course, to the particular group of students that you have. Okay, so let's move on uh, through this um, uh, zombie activity on the Inspire. And we're gonna see some of the same things. You can see the graphic here is a little bit clearer uh, on the Inspire, the resolution is a little bit nicer on the screen. Uh, we can still see the, the, we get the ID on the 84, but the resolution just is a little bit nicer on the TI Inspire. So here's that guy again, turning into a zombie. And here's our scenario. And I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on this. There's more text here, but let me tell you something about kids. Once they have seen that first page, let me just go back to it. They see that first page. The guy is clearly turning into something that is not so healthy anymore. They always read this, this thing that's called the scenario. I never have to, with kids or, or adults, I never have to force them to read this. They want to read it, which is kind of a cool thing because reading, as we know, is a pretty, pretty important skill. And uh, so they read through this. So one of the things I ask them as they're reading through this and maybe you're, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to look through it as well. One of the things I ask them are, are there any words there that you don't recognize? And until probably March of this year, of 2020, there is a word right in there that in this paragraph that many students would say, I've never heard of that before. And there it is, this epidemiologist. Now, Ancient history, like in January and February of 2020, most people didn't even really know what an epidemiologist is or what they did. But Dr. Fauci has kind of put them on the map a bit. Now, the reason that we bring up uh, professions like this is because this is a STEM activity. And one of the responsibilities we have, I believe, as STEM educators, math and science educators, is to make students aware of careers that they may not have ever thought of before. I know when I was in high school, Stacy, I don't know about you, you're, you're younger than I am, which most people are nowadays, but I don't know if you ever, you know, came home and said to your mom and dad, you know what, I think I want to be an epidemiologist. I know that word never crossed my lips when I was a kid. I didn't even know what they were, but now, most people do know what they are. So these epidemiologists are uh, disease studiers, essentially. And, and like the Centers for Disease Control, if you are from Atlanta or somewhere in Georgia, a uh, big shout out to you because you're, you have a place that's crawling with epidemiologists and Centers for Disease Control. Now, if you caught a few minutes ago, I said, we're going to take this um, unreal, well, this made up scenario. I don't want to say it's unrealistic, this made up zombie scenario and we are going to bring in realism to it. For example, right there. We're gonna make this virus airborne, which means it's transported or transmitted or carried from one person maybe to another in saliva droplets through a sneeze, a cough, or whatever it happens to be. And even though the zombie virus isn't real, as far as we know, two of the most, well, two of the, the diseases that impact schools the most are transmitted in this way. 
The cold virus is transmitted in this way, as is influenza. And until recently, everybody thought COVID was in, it was transmitted in this way. And I think there's still a little bit of, of uh, research, a lot of bit of research can be done on that, but now they say it may be a little bit different form of transmission, but uh, whatever the case might be, there are definitely real diseases that are transmitted through droplets, uh, saliva droplets in the air. So then the zombies are going to attack humans and use them as the food source and so on. So let's move on. And here's the, the same kind of uh, situation, same kind of page we had before. Here's the diff four different parts of the brain and what they are responsible for. And we are going to use those four parts of the brain in our scenario with zombie characteristics. And here again, same picture of the brain. Again, a little bit clearer resolution. And here are the symptoms. So I know I'm being a bit redundant, but here's what I want to I want to call out a couple of these. Stacy mentioned something, and Stacy, jump in here if you want to. Stacy mentioned something about using this activity in different ways for different courses. In a biology class, <laughs> life science, uh, maybe environmental science, whatever it happens to be, you might actually say, well, let's take a look at these characteristics that are the result of a messed up cerebellum. Zombies clumsily shuffle forward. So losing muscle control. And with students, I say, can you guys think of any, any diseases or any conditions where a person loses control of their muscles gradually, not immediately, like they don't lose control uh, in one second or something like that, but over time. And they start mentioning diseases. They say things like ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, muscular dystrophy, MS, that all of those different, uh, the category of what we call neuro, which means nerve, muscular, which obviously means muscle, diseases, neuromuscular diseases. And as far as I know, all of those neuromuscular diseases originate with the neuro part, which is the nervous system, which is the part, which is the brain is part of the nervous system. So the nervous system controls the muscles. So if the cerebellum is messed up, it's going to have an effect somewhere in the muscular system. The other one I want to mention real quickly, because another, another uh, person that actually helped us with this activity and helped us present this activity and this will tell me uh, how old you are. If the if the the name Blossom means anything to you, then you're a little older like me. If the name Amy Farrah Fowler means something to you, then you probably were a fan of Sheldon Cooper and that whole cast on Big Bang Theory. Uh, her name is Mayim Bialik, and Mayim Bialik is actually a neuroscientist, and she actually helped us uh, with the development of this activity and also presenting this activity to students and, and teachers. And interestingly enough, she did her doctoral dissertation on a condition that causes this, causes a person to have an insatiable appetite. Insatiable, another vocabulary word for students, insatiable, as you know, means they're just never not hungry. They're always hungry. There is a condition called Prader-Willi syndrome. And Prader-Willi syndrome, notice it has the phrase, it has the word syndrome in it, just like the phrase Down syndrome. Syndromes are not diseases. Syndromes are oftentimes call, caused by, uh, in this case, a chromosomal abnormality. So Down syndrome is caused by an extra chromosome at fertilization. Prader-Willi syndrome is caused by, I believe, a deletion in one of the uh, chromosomes. But young people who have Prader-Willi syndrome, and they don't, they don't get it by getting a, a disease. They are, they are born with this condition. People who have Prader-Willi syndrome literally have zero appetite suppressant. So they are always hungry. The story I, I tell is my wife, who is an elementary teacher for 40 years, had two students over her course of her career with Prader-Willi syndrome, and it was tragic. I mean, it sounds 
maybe not quite so bad. It's like, man, I, I, you know, my teenage boy has an insatiable appetite, but that's not what this is all about. Uh, because as with most syndromes, including Down syndrome, the resulting um, characteristics and issues that come up with chromosomal abnormalities are more than meets the eye sometimes. So these uh, young people who have these insatiable appetites have to literally be blocked from eating themselves to the point where they hurt themselves. And uh, in addition, they have other kind of issues as well. Life expectancy is in the 20s somewhere. Usually they don't survive a whole lot longer than this. So it's very sad. But the point of this is not to make you sad. The point is to say, as a thinking teacher, you can say, hey, let's see, are there any real human conditions that are the result of a malfunctioning of, in this case, the hypothalamus? Um, this one, Stacy teaches high You still teach high school, right, Stacy? And this, yep. is, this is pretty much like freshman boys here, isn't it? <laughs> Total freshman boys, yep. Well, I would argue maybe uh, older than that, too. But nevertheless, the frontal lobe, the cerebrum is a problem solving. And the amygdala is sometimes called the crocodile part of the brain, uh, which basically, you know, crocodiles are never in good moods. They're always ticked off about something, so they're always full of rage and, and so on. So, Stacy, in your uh, in your previous life, like last year, when you were teaching some biology, um, is there a way that you would use something like this that I haven't mentioned? No, I, I mean, the entire activity, um, this beginning part, which you're about to show yeah. with the color coding and leading the students into conversation about if they know of a disease or a syndrome like you discussed, um, and also, what do you know about zombies? It, it, it's just a real world application in the fact of their life. If you can make a connection with students in their lives at that time, then you've hooked them and then you, you've interest them into what they, um, where they are at the time. So yeah, this is, um, this is intense right now with the, some of the stuff you're about to show, Jeff. Absolutely. Thanks, Stacy. Let's go to the, the next one again. This is the, the guy who turns into a zombie. I'll just let you see what this looks like on uh, the Inspire. So I just clicked on the little green play button. It goes a little bit quicker on the Inspire. The Inspire's processor is a little bit faster, a little bit more robust than on the 84, but still on the 84, you can still do this. And I'm not touching anything right now. This is a continuous loop that'll just keep going and going and going and going so the, the students can watch this more than one time. And you can tell when the kids have actually clicked on the play button because when they get to, I'll pause this, when they get to stage four, their faces kind of, the students' faces kind of change. They kind of get, get all uh, cringy when they take a look at that because it is kind of scary sometimes for kids to see something like that. And again, another, uh, another issue. I don't know if I would use this activity with fourth, fifth, sixth graders. I mean, it's you don't want to have them come home from school and have nightmares. But uh, again, that's your discretion, you're a professional, and you can make that call. All right, let's go to the next page. Here we have, so far we've been pretty sciencey. You know, we've looked at viruses, we've looked at, we've looked at a virus that causes people to become zombies, we've talked about epidemiologists, we've talked about brain anatomy, and so on. So now it's time for the, the M in STEM, the math people, to have their moment or many moments in the sun. So this page is really kind of funny because students get to the last line here, and obviously we're trying to call that out by making it red. And they take a look at the next page, and at first, let me just show you what it looks like. At first, it's like the biggest letdown of their day because they look at that and they're like, Oh, yeah, really scary, you know. But I would argue that in the last several months, because of context, this graph has indeed not only become pretty familiar, but it has become fairly scary. There was a, uh, a three-word introduction to our vocabulary or, or a phrase that has three words it was introduced to our vocabulary i believe in march maybe february or march that was flatten the curve everybody has heard that 
<laughs> prior to COVID, uh, flattened the curve probably didn't mean anything to a lot of people. And even after COVID, flatten the curve was sort of like this nebulous sort of, what are you talking about flatten the curve? Well, that's a mathematical thing that is based in a scientific thing. So we have science and math coming together to make this, this STEM activity. Now, I made the point when we were going through the agenda that analyzing or evaluating or interpreting data is a critical skill for students to have, especially when kids get into high school, if they are going to take uh, some high stakes exams like the ACT, SAT, AP exams, IB exams, state tests, those exams now are loaded with non-verbal information like this. This is a graph. I mean, that's, I don't, I'm not trying to insult anybody, but this graph is worth a week of content with your students. Yeah, so Jeff. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, right before, you know, um, for us teachers in the classroom, the Friday the 13th happened, um, my uh, district and my state requires the ACT for all juniors. Um, and so the two, the next Tuesday was going to be our state test. And so that whole week prior to, um, I was doing ACT review stuff and I was kind of bored with the typical stuff. And so I broke out the zombie activity on the Wednesday, um, before we really knew where we were going. And the Wednesday was this, let's talk about zombies. And we looked at this curve and then my students started asking questions, you know, about the, um, COVID outbreaks and that kind of stuff. Um, it was, it was the craziest real world teachable moment connections I have ever had with students. Um, and it was, it was because of this activity. Um, and I was just trying to prepare them for the ACT the following week. So it's, it's funny you mentioned that. And I bet Stacy prior to, was it March 13th? Was that the Friday the 13th? Yeah, that was Friday the 13th. That the last day of school. Yeah. Prior to that, kids may have looked at this and yawned a little bit. This this particular page, I mean, ah, whatever, I'm not in an algebra class, so I'm not gonna pay attention to that. But they don't yawn it anymore. No, because not anymore, graphs, yeah. Yeah, they've seen graphs like this dozens of times in various media over the last several months. One thing to that, that I think is so critical to to help kids understand and to help kids come to a realization of is when you look at this graph, when you look at, for example, and I'm not going to touch the dots yet, but from weeks one to five, if you ask students what's going on with the numbers, they'd probably say nothing because those data markers, those data points, those red dots are just hanging out on that horizontal line, on that axis down there. But if you take your cursor and hover over each of those data points, there's what's called an ordered pair associated with each data point. And you can see that the first number, which is the independent variable, or if you're a math person, you might say that's X, is increasing by one each time, so one week. The second number is increasing by not a consistent interval, it's increasing by a geometric interval. I think that's the right word there. So eventually when that second number gets high enough that those red dots start to just barely move off the line and it continues to zoom up until you get to the point where we've maxed out, the, at least on the scale on this graph. So scale, it has a big bearing on the appearance of the graph. Okay. Let's go to the next page. We'll go back one. What do you think, and not to, we're going to go to that, that picture on the next page, but I, I forgot to mention something here. A really great question and a great thought with your kids, and this has to do with predicting. What, how many zombies would there be at 15 weeks, 20 weeks, 25 weeks? Or eventually, you can really trick your students into something here. Eventually, you could get them to increase the number of zombies so much that that second number in parentheses would be something like a trillion. Now, mathematically, that is a correct answer. Like, you just keep increasing it. Keep, I think it's tripling it is what we're doing, tripling it each time. So you increase it 
multiply by three each time. So eventually you're going to get to a number that is so huge. And then you say to the students, well, wait, 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 wait. How many zombies could we have? And the correct answer is, I don't know. What's the population of the Earth? However many people there are is the, ready calculus teachers, limit to how many zombies there can be. Now, if you're like, calculus, no can do, don't want to do that. All right, you teach life science and you teach ecology or environmental science, there are something, there are things called limiting factors with population growth. And in the case of COVID or zombieism, that, and I don't want to be cynical, with COVID, the curve will flatten. Whether we wear masks, isolate or whatever, whether we do that or not, the curve is going to flatten one way or another. The whole point behind the flatten the curve campaign was to get it to flatten before it got out of control. Uh, I don't know if we succeeded, but I hope you understand that, that this has more, this activity is more than just zombies. There is some really powerful math and science going on here. Stacey, anything before I go to the next page? Nope, you did. Okay. This picture is, uh, anybody here from Kansas? Do we have anybody on uh, webinar tonight from Kansas? If so, this picture was taken in your state. I believe this is either in Leavenworth or Lawrence. I can't remember which one, but this is a picture taken uh, of something called an armory. An armory, they, I don't know if they still have them anywhere. Um, but this is a makeshift hospital. This picture was taken in 1918 when the influenza epidemic in that year was at its peak. And 1918, in that time period, World War I was also happening. Uh, World War I is in the history books. I mean, like it, it's part of the history course. The influenza epidemic, I'm not sure if that is, but I believe it should be. Because way, 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 way more people died of influenza than died in World War I. In fact, it's estimated, and data records and all that kind of stuff were not as good back 100 years ago. It's estimated that worldwide, 50 million people died from influenza. And back then, I think it was called the Spanish flu, but it was influenza. 50 million. Now, you might say, well, yeah, a lot of people died of COVID. Okay, but in 1918, the global population was way less than it is today. So the percentage of people who succumbed to influenza 100 years ago was staggering. It was estimated that one-fourth of the world's population was infected with influenza, which is, to me, mind-boggling. So you have 50 million people died of this. Now, you know what kids say to me? Well, why didn't they just get a flu shot? And I know you're probably laughing, but if you're in your 20s, you may not be laughing. You may be going, yeah, why didn't they get a flu shot? Well, that gives a great opportunity to bring up the history of immunizations and vaccinations and so on. In 1918, there were no flu shots. There were, I don't know if there was anything, maybe smallpox might have been the only, uh, the only immunization that was available. May, that may not even have been available yet. So great historical opportunity to talk about uh, the impact that immunizations have had on the health of our population. <clears throat> All right, the, the last thing we're going to do here, and let me give you, I'm going to also do a full disclosure so you don't think I'm trying to fake you out. The, if you pull this activity off the TI website and put it on your calculator or your computer, you will notice that there are way more pages in the activity that you pull off the website than there are in the one I'm using, like probably three times more. And the reason for that is most of the pages I deleted were like question pages where you have the kids answer a question or something like that. So I pared this down a lot to make sure we had uh, that we didn't go over time by showing too many pages. But this is one I wanted to make sure we left in here. Obviously, we're trying to call the attention to this word, virulence. Um, Virulence basically means how easy is it to get this from one person to another. So, for example, uh, even though this disease is, is kind of rare now, hardly anybody ever gets it anymore because there's an immunization against it, but chickenpox was a, was a disease that 
you know, when I was a kid, we all got chicken pox. And if you're over the age of 40, you probably had it. Uh, our, we have three girls and they all got it. In fact, they all got it on the same day, which is good and bad. But chicken pox is really virulent. It's really easy to get chicken pox from one person to the next. It's not really, really deadly, but it's really virulent. So that's an example of something that's very virulent. So let's take a look at quantifying this virulence. So here we have a real busy page. We have two graphs. We have a classic independent, dependent variable or XY graph over here showing time with no units. Just, you know, that's a great, uh, opportunity to say to the students what would be an appropriate unit of time here and then the number of zombies here and over here kind of a weird looking graph that is boxes so the virulence is adjusted by clicking on these little arrows and the virulence goes from one to ten so let's be wishy-washy let's be fence sitters and we'll go to a virulence of five so about right in the middle so let's i'm going to click on play and then trust me i know you can't see me i'm not going to click on anything else i'm just going to let this run now watch what happens with a virulence of five, all the red squares are zombies on the left, and we're graphing the rate of zombie production. Okay, so just kind of get your head around that a little bit and, and look and see how about how much time did it take to max out our infection through this population. And did everybody get turned into a zombie? And again, great point of discussion. We still have some humans that have not been zombified. And is that realistic? Well, I would say, yes, it is realistic. Uh, if anybody, I know I'm dating myself here, but I think one of Stephen King's very first books was maybe one of his best, it's called The Stand. And in The Stand, it's amazingly creepy and, and spooky how that sort of mirrors what's going on today, even though in the stand that the virus uh, killed an awful lot more people than, than COVID does. But nevertheless, it's a pretty powerful book. And there were people who did not get infected. They were resistant to it or, or whatever it happened to be. Stacy, anything here? Yeah, no, so that, that can show that, so what you're showing is that it has a virulence of five, but there is nothing to protect the humans from the zombie virus. Wanting to do this in a COVID classroom like we have now, what measures could we use or to protect ourselves? And so we talked about uh, the social distancing, you know, covering your cough and germex or, or washing your hands or whatever um, to prevent, even though the virus is that virulent, if there was some kind of barrier, um, then possibly it wouldn't be as bad. So, yeah. And Stacey, when you, when you talk to your students now um, about COVID, what are, what are they, tell me what you're hearing from them. Um, not a whole lot. <laughs> They they really don't like to talk with masks on. This last week um, was probably the first week I actually got my kids finally to talk science. Um, but they not a single student um, negates what the preventative measures we're doing in the classroom with the um, you know hand sanitizing, masks, social distance. We're a, um, a hybrid system, and we all know that it's what's best for the whole population. Um, but they, they do have a lot of questions um, about uh, the long-term effects of uh, Germex or uh, antibiotics and, I mean, um, germ, uh, antibacterial hand sanitizers, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I mean, my kids are great. I mean, they're going to do what they need to do to be in school. So right now, you know, we're, we're, we're just we're doing what we need to be to do to be in school. So I wonder if you, and this is uh, not just for uh, Stacy, but for anybody, but again, being a thinking teacher, you can look at this data or these data here, and you're like, well, we still got a bunch of humans left over that have not been turned into zombies yet. Why? What did they do or what has happened that has prevented that? And then relate this to COVID, which can be something like, what can you do 
and what have you been doing to increase your chances of not contracting this virus? Or let's say, what do you think, if somebody is resistant to it, they're just not going to get this zombie virus. But what do you think would be a, a, some good solutions or some good preventative measures uh, for somebody to, to avoid becoming a zombie? That type of thing. So I guess if anybody's watched The Walking Dead, there are some solutions there. They usually involve weapons. I yeah, Jeff, too, you mentioned vaccines. And so if you took this into a different type of virus and not necessarily a zombie virus, so maybe those individuals, those humans had the vaccination and that's why they didn't get infected um, about the, you know, the Spanish flu you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And and that the, the Spanish flu or the, that influenza epidemic is, um, you know, whatever your feeling is about vaccinations or immunizations, it's kind of hard to argue that they haven't had some impact on the, the health of our general population. So um, that's our virulence of five. You know what I'm going to do? We do have a couple minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom this up to 10. If you remember over here, I think it maxed out at about week 15 or something like that. So if we make this really, really crazy virulent, like as, as virulent as we can possibly make it, and just check out how fast this is happening. We max this one out, oh, a couple ticks earlier than the previous one. Plus, take a look at this. Number of humans, a little bit less, and so on. Now, one thing about TI Inspire, if you have Inspires in your classroom and you have the TI Navigator system, you could have uh, students do all your virulences, just have every kid do a different one. And then you can display them all for uh, the whole class to see, and each student only needs to do one. Now, the cool thing here, another cool thing here, while you were doing that, on the next page, another graph was being generated. This is actually based off of the data on these graphs. So here, uh, if you're an algebra teacher, especially algebra one or algebra two, I guess that maybe that's all there is in, in most high schools, but there's some pretty great stuff you can do with this graph in an algebra classroom. And um, like, where do those two graphs intersect? Where do they cross? And how many times will they cross? Well, there's some really great discussion there. But that point of intersection, if you could put some equations on here, or put functions on there, you could solve a system of equations by figuring out where those two intersected and so on. So there's a legitimate uh, integration and a, a bringing together of science and math using, of all things, you guys, zombies. I mean, who would have thought? We certainly didn't. When we set out to do the zombie activity, we never thought it would transcend the entire math and science curriculum, literally. And, you know, it's October, so it can transcend the entire Halloween curriculum, too, uh, during the month of October. So now this is one way you know that that uh, I really pared this down because there's not that many pages in this activity or in the one I that we're seeing tonight. This is the name of the guy. If you're interested in zombies, Stephen Schlossman, Dr. Schlossman, uh, is the guy who helped us with this activity. In addition, in addition to a Blossom, Amy Farrell, and Maya Bialik, and he actually has the, uh, he wrote a novel called The Zombie Autopsies. And speaking of that, we just have a couple of minutes, but um, there is a zombie apocalypse part two, and Stacy, I would like you to, if you wouldn't mind, talk about talk about why this one gives you goosebumps. You get all excited about this one. I do. This is um, one of my. I, I like the zombie one because um, it the logistic curve and having the conversation <laughs> with students and what ACT data looks like and questions. Um, but this one hits home for me as a chemistry teacher that. Um, especially this year, sometimes there's not enough time in the curriculum to actually do um, titrations. And this activity takes into account that now we know what the zombie virus is. It's a prion virus, um, very similar to the mad cow disease. And so because of that, we've isolated this virus, and now we can try to cure it. And so curing it allows for us to take this virus and expose it to a different pH um, that's different from the body's pH, and we, we can actually um, get rid of it. Um, and so as the activity goes on, Jeff kind of going through it, there's questions embedded in this. 
Um, you could do it as a formative assessment. You could send it to them on a Google form or whatever you're doing, but then it's a titration simulation. Um, and so we have the virus that's in our solution. Um, we have the TICX that's plugged in with a pH sensor. Um, there's the, on the right hand side, the molecular level view of the ions that are associated that are going on. <clears throat> we have a graph at the top right that'll show once we start actually adding um, a base to our titration. Um, what happens, and so Jeff's going to go ahead and press play for me, and then we can see the ions moving around. Molecular level views for me is so big in chemistry. Um, I get, like, nerdy on them, um, and then as we add the base to the solution, we can see the graph changing. We can see the pH changing. We can see the molecular level view changing, um, and so if you're, like, in chemistry, and you're strapped for time, and you really want to show students the importance of a titration and what's happening on the molecular level of you, what's happening with a neutralization reaction. This activity is actually really fun um, to do with students. If they get to see the titration, they get to see the endpoint, they get to see the color change, they get to see it all and not necessarily have two class periods to perform an actual titration. Um, and then the, the activity itself that Jeff has up has questions embedded um, that you could use for some type of formative assessment, um, some type of a, a response, maybe whole class, maybe it's, you know, just you and the student. Um, remember I mentioned that there's Word documents and there's teacher documents, student documents that are downloadable if you needed to provide that for students, um, but then as we go throughout this activity, we actually found the cure for zombies. If we just titrate their blood, um, we can kill this prion virus and actually save all the people. So that's why I get giddy about it. Titrations, I really like titrations. Stacy gets, you know, I love it because she gets really nerded out with this, this uh, titration thing. But kind of to wrap this up, look how that graph in the top right where it's pH over uh, the volume of sodium hydroxide. Uh, this actually mirrors, in a way, the graph that was so scary, quote unquote, in the previous activity. There is a limit. This is going to level off. This, this curve will flatten. The pH, the maximum pH you can achieve is 14. So it doesn't matter how much of this stuff I continue to dribble in there, I'm never going to exceed 14. I can run that burette. That burette's that big tube there that I'm dribbling out of. I can run that dry, and this is never going to change. It's going to stay at below 14. So, math teachers, there we have our concept of limit. Stacy, I'm looking at our time, and that was about perfect, my dear. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Did awesome. And I'm going to, Mike, I'm going to give this back to you because you are. Host. Thanks so much, Jeff and Stacy. Uh, we have a couple minutes left, and with those couple minutes, one thing I do want to share on our website, again, education.ti.com, um, is some of you are looking to get a trial version of the software. If you click on distance learning resources on the right-hand side, and then get support, Here you'll find those trial versions for the software for both Inspire and the SmartView software for 84. Um, so please visit that uh, if you're looking to learn more about uh, the software that we have available for trial versions. Um, if you'd like to receive a full licensed version for a limited time, uh, you can contact your local ETC, your Educational Technology Consultant. And if you didn't know uh, who or what they are or where to find them, on any of our web pages uh, on our website, on the bottom is a contact TI. And if you click on that, find your TI sales support. And this is a list and contact information of all of the local um, ed educational technology consultants. Um, and currently, if you reach out to them uh, that you're suggesting uh, that students purchase TI technology uh, for your classroom on your syllabus and you give them your syllabus, uh, they should be able to hook you up with a licensed version of the TI Inspire software or the TI84 SmartView software. 
Um, so that is a licensed version for, for you forever, um, no trial version. To receive a certificate of attendance for tonight, go ahead and click the link that just appeared in the chat window. Also, this is a link for the documents for tonight. And if you are uh, having trouble with these links, have no fear, you'll automatically get a follow-up email within a couple of days. Uh, and that follow-up email will contain uh, links to the recording, the certificate, as well as the documents. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. Big thanks to Jeff and Stacy for everything they shared tonight. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, it's very timely with not only uh, what's going on in the world, but also the upcoming holiday. So thanks so much. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you back online real soon. Have a great night.